This uh, May 16th meeting of the Board of the Harbor Commissions will come to order. Um, Ms. Brzezinski, would you call the roll, please? Betsy Kramer. Present. Bill Spicer. Here. Corey Bantelin. Here. Eric Friedman. Here. Frank Kelly. Here. Jim Sloan. Here. Helene Webb. Here. Mr. Reedman, are there any changes to the agenda? Madam Chair, there are no changes to the agenda. Thank you. This would be the point of public comment for anything that's not on the agenda. Does anyone have a public comment? Apparently not, so a uh, couple people raising their hands over there. Uh, Are these? Okay, um, Kathleen Keller. Um, I'm just here, I'm a resident, I'm not, I don't live in the harbor, I just kind of heard a bit about what's going on, so I'm here to learn more. Um, and from what I've heard, I don't agree with the blue permit issue, so like I said, I'm just here to learn a little bit more and uh, address that later. So you're not a resident of Santa Barbara? I'm a resident of Santa Barbara, not a harbor resident. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess anyone else? Then I will, for public comment, items that are not on the agenda. Uh, maybe you want to speak on the item when it comes up on the agenda? Yeah, parking is on the agenda. Blue. The blue's not. I know, but they haven't filled out a permit. Madam Chair, yeah. well, staff recommends that we just take these comments, since they are a parking issue, that we just take them along with the parking item that is agendized for this evening. Okay, thank you, Mr. Reedman. Um, so then I will now close the public comment that has to do with items that are not on the agenda. Um, okay, the next item is the approval of the minutes. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I'm abstaining since and, I wasn't here. And one abstention. Um, department update. Mr. Reedman, please. Good evening, Madam Chair, Commissioners. In terms of council action, uh, the council authorized the waterfront director to execute a representative services agreement between the city and Carpe and Clay, Inc., which is our um, lobbying uh, company out in Washington, D.C. They keep us apprised of mostly of dredging matters um, and look out for bills that might affect dredging funding and, and do their best to make sure we, we get uh, funding every year. So we're quite pleased with their work and continued the contract for another two years. Um, in terms of tentative agenda items for the June meeting, we have a lease ready with the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary for their research vessel Shearwater, which leases some mooring space in the harbor. Um, however, um, we'll let you know in a week or two, we may not have a June meeting due to staff vacations. We have a couple of our uh, key staff members that are going to be taking vacation, so um, may cancel that meeting. Thank you very much. Are there any questions, comments from the commissioners? Mm -hmm. and, uh, the business report, Mr. Bossi, please. Good evening, Madam Chair. I'm here to give you a report on the cruise ship passenger data. Um, so far this year, we've had 10 cruise ships, and cruise ships have been visiting Santa Barbara since uh, 2002. And since that time, we've had <laughs> approximately 39 cruise ships make Santa Barbara a destination um, on their voyages. Um, these cruise ships frequent Santa Barbara in generally the slower business months of April and May and then take a break and then come back um, towards the latter half of September into the early part of November. By coming in on the peak seasons, um, they do help provide an economic shot um, to our downtown as well as our waterfront and they've received strong endorsement and support of our downtown organization and our Chamber of Commerce. The waterfront department continues to team up with the Chamber of Commerce and the downtown organization um, to make passengers visit to the city of Santa Barbara that much more enjoyable. The downtown organization and the chamber provide hosts at the departure when they come off the ship and help them with maps and itinerary and things like that. The total amount of passengers on visiting cruise ships generally varies between about 1,800 and 3,100 people per ship. And in working with uh, 
the cruise ships, what we found is a lot of people, even prior to working with the cruise ships, what we found is a lot of people ask, well, what do those 1,800 or 3,100 people do when they get here? Where do they go? Are they contributing to our local economy? So over the past few months, we've been working with our cruise ship contacts and f have da data from the first cruise ships that showed up this year, the, six, the first six cruise ships. And of those 12,192 passengers um, that were able to come on shore, 97% of those passengers stay within Santa Barbara or the immediate local area. Only 3%, or about 320 of those passengers, actually go on um, tours up and over uh, into, into the Santa Ynez Valley. Most of the folks who do come on shore um, enjoy organized local tours, such as the local trolley tours, that's the biggest draw, urban wine trail tours, photo tours. A lot of people also go whale watching. So again, 97% of our passengers that come off, off the ship stay here locally, and only 3% go up and over the hill to San Inez Valley. Uh, with 11 more cruise ships, um, planned for the fall season, again, mid to late September through the middle of November. The, 28, the possible 28,000 visitors to our shore will definitely continue to help with our local economy, both at the waterfront as well as the downtown. And that, I believe, with that, Mr. Reedman has some comments that he'd like to make. Thank you, Mr. Boss. Thanks, Brian. Um, I'd just like to add a few thoughts about the cruise ships um, relative to public health and environmental protection, which are staff's highest priorities rel relevant to these cruise ship visits. When the Pr Princess Cruise Line uh, first inquired about visiting Santa Barbara and making a port call here about 10 years ago, at the department we knew it would be imperative that uh, we be proactive about environmental concerns. We knew this would be an issue. Uh, so for the first cruise vi visit, um, we drafted a captain's declaration wherein the captain agrees not to discharge any wastewater within 12 miles of the coast or, in, or use the, incinerator, the ship's incinerator. The legal limit for uh, discharging wastewater is only three miles. So we went well beyond the legal limit to 12 miles for discharges. Princess agreed to the captain's declaration and those requirements and that has served as a model for all subsequent cruise ship visits. They all have agreed to it. Each captain signs one of these declarations before they come into waters around Santa Barbara. Um, on another matter, recently when a ship visited on an overcast day in April, there was a visible plume uh, of, ex of exhaust coming from the ship, which we got a couple phone calls down to the department on that. Um, I believe the APC did as well. The department contacted the County Air Pollution Control District and uh, they sent an inspector down to the ship well, we carried him out there in a harbor patrol boat, and he met with the ship's engineer, toured the ship, and determined that the ship was in, client, in compliance with emission standards on that visit. So we were proactive in getting the experts down there to look at the, to talk to the right people and, and get the right answers. Uh, in May, a cruise ship en route to Santa Barbara contacted Sea Landing and reported that a number of passengers had been diagnosed with a gastrointestinal viral. Um, sickness. At, Mick and I discussed scrubbing the ship visit and then contacted the city administrator, which is our protocol, um, who in turn contacted the county's chief administrative officer, who in turn contacted the county public health director, Dr. Takashi Wada. The next morning, which happened to be a Sunday, uh, upon the ship's arrival, Dr. Wada was transported out to the ship to meet with the sh ship's chief medical officer to review the protocols in place for quarantining sick passengers and screening passengers that wanted to head ashore. Uh, satisfied that the protocols were sufficient to protect public health, Dr. Wada cleared the, the ship visit, and that was the May ship, ship visit. Uh, so that concludes the cruise ship matter, unless there are any questions. Thank you very much for that uh, explanation and amplification of the Report. Are there any comments, questions from the Commission? Um, uh, Commissioner Friedman. Uh, thanks for that report, Scott. Um, I just wanted, I noticed that uh, the urban wine trails were specifically mentioned, and I think that's great um, promoting the funk zone because I know there's a lot of work going on within the funk zone to try to make it its own kind of destination separate from the downtown, and I just want to. Um, continue to urge that in terms of how we can accommodate and, and make that a destination in addition to the downtown. But um, it, it's great to see that, especially with all that's going on down there.
Uh, Commissioner Spicer. Uh, thank you for the report and the um, diligence on the public health and, and the um, <clears throat> uh, discharge. Uh, my question is on the um, on the ballast water or wastewater discharge at the 12 mile limit. Can we set that or whatever we want? And I suppose if it becomes too arduous, they just won't come. Is, is that how that works? Madam Chair, Commissioner Spicer, I believe we set it at 12 because that was more or less midway to the Channel Islands. Mick can correct me if I'm wrong. He was the author of that captain's declaration, but we just wanted to go above and beyond the minimal requirements. Thank you. And I have a question on that uh, discharge, the 12 miles. Is there any checking being done at that point, given the amount of um, uh, comments in the online media? Uh, I was wondering if people can be assured that there is, in fact, no, no discharge being done. Is channel keeper checking it out or? Madam, Madam Chair, um, the ship is required to keep logs, and um, uh, sh that's, that's one matter of quote-unquote checking, if you will. It's a, it's a, if they mishandle their logs or if they misrepresent their logs relative to where they're doing any dumping or incinerating, that's a huge problem for the cruise ship lines. Number two, we have personally invited the channel keeper to test around the ship when it's in port. And, and I believe they have solicited folks to do overflights. Uh, they're looking for volunteers to do overflights of the ships when they're coming to Santa Barbara and leaving Santa Barbara. And we would encourage uh, any of that as well because um, we expect the captain's deck, we expect the cruise ship, uh, to, the cruise ship lines to adhere to the um, specifications in the captain's declaration. So I can't say for sure that folks are out there checking. I know Channel Keeper has been out when they're out in port. But certainly, if anybody wanted to do overflights and report, uh, that would be fine. With one cautionary note, folks need to know what they're seeing and reporting on when they report it, you know, or like put, post it on Ed Hat. And you may remember a couple months ago, the ship was using its bow thrusters to stay on station so people could comfortably embark and disembark from the ship. It stirred up a little sand. Somebody took a picture from an airplane. It went on to Ed Had, and the next thing you knew, half the community thought they were polluting the, you know, the Santa Barbara Harbor area. So certainly, you know, vigilance is welcome, but we should all be careful about what we're looking at and, and how it's described. Thank you very much. Um, any other questions, comments from the commissioners? Um, on to the facilities management report, Mr. Triberg. Uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners, last month Commissioner Kelly inquired about a couple of programs at the Harbor. One was our custodial services uh, provided by Work Incorporated, and the other had to do with the fish market and um, some of their operations in the, in the alley behind that building. <clears throat> Beginning with our custodial services throughout the waterfront, we are responsible for maintaining and servicing 13 restrooms, um, as well as over 100 trash containers, it's more than you'd expect. It's done by three different entities, Work Inc., which is a nonprofit organization, Service Master is a private contractor, and the work is also done by uh, Waterfront uh, Facilities Division staff. Work Inc. has provided services to the waterfront for over 25 years, and their main areas of responsibility are the five restrooms and the marinas, four of which contain uh, shower facilities as well, and um, the Harbor Commercial Area and the public restroom at Sea Landing. They sanitize the restrooms, they do periodic daily inspections, and they also resupply those restrooms. Council recently awarded a two-year contract for $243,000, uh, which was a 5% increase over the previous contract. Council exercises their authority under the municipal code to do a non-competitive bid uh, contract with Work Inc. because it is a nonprofit organization and provided good service to us in the past, and they've done so for many, many years. <clears throat> Nevertheless, in 2007, uh, just to kind of compare with their costs where we did solicit a, an informal bid from a private contractor and they came up with an estimate of about $290,000 to provide the same services. <clears throat> so we're comfortable with the service that's being provided by Work Inc. Uh, we, like the, we like what they do and um, we think the cost is pretty competitive. Service Master is a private contractor and we recently uh, submitted a low bid of $90,000 to service several restrooms throughout the harbor, a couple at the waterfront center, and three restrooms, Stearns Wharf, the visitor center by the garden lot and the Leadbetter lot. Uh, those three restrooms we inherited, for lack of a better term, about three years ago. Um, they also do some uh, common area maintenance in the waterfront center. Their low bid was $90,000, uh, which is pretty competitive, and we are uh, authorized to 
award, renew that contract for five years, de depending on changes in living wage and a few other negotiable things. And the remainder of the work is actually done by waterfront staff. Waterfront staff tends to open and or close the restrooms and does some periodic inspection as well. Uh, one of the most significant costs of restroom and custodial services is janitorial supplies. The city only purchases green janitorial supplies, which sometimes aren't quite as effective as cleaning as some of the non-green materials. Nevertheless, uh, every year there's new materials available, and so uh, our, our purchasing department kind of looks at new stuff and, and tries to improve um, the cleaning ability of those products. At a total of $427,000, um, Custodial services is about 12% of the entire facilities division, so there's a huge investment and commitment to, to keeping the restrooms and the trash containers empty throughout the waterfront. Just wanted to put that in perspective for you this evening. Uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Kelly also inquired about the fish market. The fish market is located at the west end of the 117 building, and the 117 building also has our, uh, our maintenance shop and the On the Alley restaurant, and at the, at the east end is the Brophy Brothers uh, restaurant and Sushi Go Go. They moved there in 2006 uh, from a smaller little unit that they had in that building, and they've grown dramatically over the years. They've, it's, a, it's a business that's really, really grown. Um, they do most of their fish processing or all their fish cutting up inside the building itself, but all the fish that arrives at the fish market goes in through the back at the alley, and it either comes in totes, those large plastic totes, or it comes in boxes, and they're all packed with ice, <clears throat> and the ice melts. So there's melt water from the ice and whatever fish is associated with that going into the trench drain that feeds into the harbor that's kind of between uh, Brophy Brothers Restaurant and the Waterfront Center on a regular basis. And we have had some problems with that in the past. It's, sometimes it gets a little stagnant, gets a little warm, and, and there are unpleasant odors. Uh, Scott worked with the uh, fish market to initiate a program to clean that trench drain on a regular basis to try and mitigate some of that. And that's cleaning it and, and absorbing it and sucking it up, not washing it into the bay. Nevertheless, it's, it's a nuisance that we just don't seem to be able to get a handle on. So we are working with the fish market and with our wastewater treatment plant to design a, uh, a diversion similar to those that you see along uh, adjacent to most trash enclosures in anywhere in the city. There's several at the harbor itself. So along the trench drain itself, you, you capture a section of that drainage and you divert it into the stormwater system. Each of these systems have a shutoff valve that is triggered by rainwater so that we don't wind up diverting a bunch of rainwater or, or flood water to the sewer treatment plant, which happens frequently. It's a, it's a major nuisance to them. So we're kind of designing those details at this time, and, and we hope to have that uh, installed in the next month or so. We've already met with the wastewater treatment plant. They have approved it in concept. So we're moving forward with that, and we feel that uh, this project is going to allow them to clean the area frequently, which will be nice. It's going to minimize the odors, and it's going to really, really help us maintain our water quality. So that concludes my report this evening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. And the questions, uh, Commissioner Kelly. Just a simple comment. Carl, thank you very much for the report. You covered all the points, and um, I think the information was very enlightening and, and resolved any questions that I had in my <laughs> mind. So thank you. Uh, Commissioner Friedman. Uh, Carl, just a couple of quick questions. One was, did, in the research on alternatives, did we look at what other similar facilities did in comparable areas, if, if there are any that are comparable to our, our setup here? And then this uh, question, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer it, but the county, there's a local vendor outreach program. This goes to the, um, to the facilities maintenance. There's a local vendor outreach program, which uh, provides a, a preference for, for local vendors when we're procur procuring goods for 6% when they're going out on bids. Does the city have such a program? Do you know, Scott, if they would have such a program? Madam Chair, Commissioner Friedman, our, our city's purchasing department has um, a policy related to purchasing green products and vetting those products and making sure that the most they're green, environmentally friendly, and the most effective products. So we, they purchase the products for the entire city. So it's all done through them. We don't go out separately and, and, and pursue those ourselves. I was uh, specifically re re um, going in terms of the, the vendor who provides the service, if they're a local vendor or they're out-of-town vendor. I mean, that's part of it, too, but also we, we hire like local okay. contractors, too, as part of it. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I misunderstood the question. Um, I don't believe the city has a policy related to that. It just so happens that these services are typically provided by local vendors. Service Master is a local uh, provider, and, and Work, Inc. is a local nonprofit. So. Any other questions, comments, commissioners? 
Uh, thank you for your report. So, now, uh, the Harbor Op Operations Report, Mr. Condon. Madam Chair and Commissioners, well, we had our seventh annual Operation Clean Sweep on May 4th, and uh, I was counting up the signed waivers, and it turns out we had a record number of volunteers this year. I'm really happy to report that. We had 21 divers and 45 dock workers, uh, including Chair Kramer. She was there. And uh, items removed, and I, I love detailing these because these, it always amazes me. Um, barrels, pipes, chairs, buckets, liquor bottles, milk crates, an anchor, a card table, fishing net, two boat bath liners, a crab receivers, a typewriter, and two marine batteries. Uh, marine batteries we always zoom in, uh, zero in on and keep track of, and th this makes a total of 15 marine batteries we've taken in the first seven years. So that's a, a little over two batteries a year, which is about stock. Last year, both batteries were under one slip. This year, they were in two different places. Now, it was an interesting uh, event in terms of how much stuff we got out. It was actually occurred in three stages. There was the initial event with uh, the 60-plus volu volunteers, and, um, and then a few hours later, Harbor Patrol and Waterfront Maintenance staff pulled up uh, a lot of extra junk, debris, that was too heavy for the uh, dock workers to lift. And so there were two stages of it, and by the time that was completed, uh, there were 8,200 pounds of materials that had been removed from the seafloor. But there was still yet one major phase to go, and that was the result of uh, what appeared to be an abandoned aquaculture, mariculture facility on the seafloor under Elfinger that none of us could get up, including our maintenance staff with our equipment. And so we, we contracted with the Danny C, uh, the big work boat in the harbor, uh, for the following Tuesday, and he went out and he removed uh, uh, all of the, uh, the mariculture facility, which was really heavy, and even after shoveling all the debris out of it, it still uh, amounted to enough that where we ended up with um, 14, we ended up with 8,200 pounds altogether. I apologize, the first number was 5,600 pounds. We ended up with uh, 8,200 pounds altogether, which brought us to a seven-year total of 14.4 tons. And I wanted to show you some photos of uh, the clean sweep, and I wanted, the last uh, slide is of the, uh, the, the junk, the debris, the mariculture uh, barge that uh, the Danny C removed. These are our superhero volunteer workers, just a fantastic group of folks. The spirit down there was just wonderful, as it always is. It's kind of a combination of, of hauling junk, or, you know, removing litter and, and fishing. You know, you never know quite what you're going to pull up, and it, so it's kind of, it has people really um, interested, keeps their interest. They're always, the kids especially are just like, what is this stuff? And it's good to get it off the seafloor. There's a couple of the marine batteries right there. And here was an old fishing net that we got off the bottom. As we all know, that's not good for the benthic species that try to live and survive down there, so we like to get these and the boat liners off the seafloor. Here's another bunch of junk. There's that liquor bottle. That was a substantial size bottle. Um, <laughs> and this gentleman was holding a boat propeller in one hand. And this is... These barrels are typically... Uh, fish receivers, they're barrels that are used to store, store some kind of either live fish or crustaceans. And what typically happens is they're often tied to cleats on the dock and they either chafe or break loose and uh, to the bottom they go. They're 33 gallon pickle barrels and uh, a lot of milk crates, fishing net and what have you here. And finally, there were three of these. These were the mariculture facility that was abandoned and left on the seafloor under Elfinger. There were three of these groups of nine of these barrels uh, that were removed, and uh, that's um, something we're really glad to have off the seafloor, and it really bumped up our weight this year substantially. So um, we wanted to give you those visuals so you had an idea of what we captured this year's clean sweep. And uh, that's all for this evening's report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? Any comments? I'd like to say that I thought that the real heroes were, were the divers. Uh, the water was extremely murky, and uh, those, of us stand, those of us on, this, on the docks were really were doing nothing compared to what they were doing. But uh, anyway, thank you very much for your report. Uh, next on is new business. Jeanette, would you read the staff recommendation, please?
Recommendation that Harbor Commission receive a presentation from the Santa Barbara County Air Pollution Control District and Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary on a voluntary marine vessel speed reduction incentive initiative. Thank you. Madam Chair, I believe Commissioner Bantelin requested uh, some information on this a, a few meetings ago, so we uh, thought we'd ask uh, these folks to come forward and, and give you their report. So with that, I'll turn it over to Sean Hastings and Christy and Mary. Good evening, Madam Chair, Commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Mary Bird with Santa Barbara County Air Pollution Control District, and I'll be doing this presentation with Sean Hastings of the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary and Christy Burney of the Environmental Defense Center. This is very much a collaborative effort uh, on our what we call uh, quite a mouthful, our Vessel Speed Reduction Initiative Program. So a little background from the Air Pollution Control District perspective. We have been concerned about emissions from marine shipping since our, our 1998 Clean Air Plan when we first identified the large amount of shipping pollution in our inventory. And just to give you a little background, we focus on our clean air planning efforts, focus on ozone because we do not meet the state ozone standard. And we, although do, we do meet the federal ozone standard currently, we are very close and the margin is very close and they are going to be reconsidering it. So we've been focusing on ozone precursors for a long time and that's NOx emissions. And although we do not have a port in Santa Barbara County, we have this lovely 130 miles of coastline and because of where the shipping lanes are located, the international shipping lanes, we're seeing these emissions happen relatively close to shore. So we've been working on this for a long time. We've sued the Environmental Protection Agency. We've gone to Sacramento and DC. And there has been uh, tremendous uh, strides have been made in regulation. Uh, we are seeing this results from the state fuel rule, which requires a cleaner fuel be used, lower sulfur fuel be used within so many miles of the coastline. That's giving us some immediate reductions in particulate and air toxic emissions. And then the um, EPA petitioned the International Maritime Organization to create a North American emission control area. So we're seeing international regulations start to take effect. Now the key here is the fuel regulations are producing some immediate benefits, but you'll notice I didn't mention NOx. We're not gonna see NOx benefits for a long time. So just to look at the transits over the past 12 years through the, through the Santa Barbara Channel, that big dip that you see there, that's from the combination of the economic downturn and the fact that when the state fuel rule first came in, it wasn't applying, uh, it was only applying between here and the Channel Islands, so some ships were going outside the channel in order to avoid buying the more expensive fuel. So then we're seeing some come back since the state changed its rule to apply on the outside of the Channel Islands so they can no longer avoid the rule. And not all are coming back, but as the economy improves, we may see more. So I, I mentioned NOx emissions, and that's our focus with our, a lot of our clean air planning efforts. This is quite striking when you look at it because you know, these large container ships have these giant engines and the fuel they've been burning has been bunker oil, especially before these fuel rules have come in. The engines do not have emission controls. They've not been regulated in the past. So where you see these other sources have been regulated and we've had, you know, we're benefiting from living in California, which has had very aggressive rules for fuels and cars onshore, we have not seen uh, the reductions from the shipping sector. So even when we look out further than this, we're gonna see some benefits from these rules, but we're also seeing that the, even with the international rules, now this is just talking about the NOx emissions here. We're not seeing the benefit that we need to meet our air quality standards. So we have looked around at various other ways we could address NOx reductions. And one of the things we see with the most potential has been vessel speed reduction. Because we can get near-term NOx reductions by slowing ships down. We get reductions across the board. They're more efficient when they operate at slower speeds. 
and we're getting fuel benefits also, which provides greenhouse gas reductions. Now, that's not something we're mandated to provide, but it has given us a funding opportunity that we're going to talk about a little later, so I wanted to be sure and mention that. When you increase fuel efficiency, you reduce fuel use, you're reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So um, the fact that there's also no capital investment is important because you're, you're offering an opportunity to get emission reductions without a huge investment in terms of capital. And the reason the NOx uh, standards are not going to help us over the, the near term are because they're all related to the engine NOx limits and as, as a factor of when the ships change engines. So when you think about it, how often does a, a large shipping company replace engines in its ships? So that's why that other graph was so striking, that it's going to take us a while to get those reductions. Another thing we have found from looking at vessel speed reduction is that there are significant benefits with whale protection, which has brought us to our partnerships. And so I'm going to turn it over now to Sean to talk a little more on that side. Thank you, Mary. So uh, representing the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, for context, we're within the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is within the Department of Commerce. And we're a federal partner of yours in the harbor. And um, we um, have been working on shipping issues as they relate to whale conservation and whale protection. So a common thread you're going to hear through um, this story uh, is ship. The ships are sources of air pollution and, unfortunately, uh, are also um, threatened and increased risk to uh, endangered species, uh, namely the great whales that visit our channel every year. And the slide, um, thank you, Mary, the slide, um, this slide shows how important, how vibrant our, our Santa Barbara Channel is, not only to the great whales, not only to the large container ships, but of course to the whale watch uh, industry and whale watch fleet uh, that takes thousands of visitors out to the channel uh, into the sanctuary and to view these animals. And I mentioned that I'm part of the Department of Commerce because really there's no villain here. We, we all rely on maritime commerce. Forty percent of all the nation's goods come through the ports of L.A. and, um, uh, and Long Beach. Ninety percent of all uh, products are moved by ships throughout the world. So we depend on maritime commerce. What you're hearing tonight is with maritime commerce comes certain impacts, air quality being one, and what I'm going to cover is the uh, threats to the endangered whales, which unfortunately um, don't seem to get out of the way. And many of you will recall in 2007, we had uh, five blue whales show up in Santa Barbara County, Ventura County, and on the Channel Island shorelines that were later to have been determined uh, to have been hit by a ship. And there's really only one thing that can knock a blue whale out of the water, and that they, that's these large container ships. And um, it's, uh, it's unfortunate these ship captains, they don't see the whales. They don't know they even hit them. So, uh, again, not trying to paint any villains here in this story, uh, but there are impacts associated with shipping, and you saw the shipping lanes coming right through the channel. They pass through the sanctuary, and uh, unfortunately, it's right where the, uh, these whales feed. And uh, you see here on the bottom slide, a near miss, um, that, was, that image was taken uh, during an aerial survey that we conducted. And um, again, the, you can see the bridge is two-thirds of the way back on the ship. There's no way that captain saw that whale. And we want those ships in those shipping lanes. We do not want them driving outside of those lanes to avoid uh, animals because safety of navigation is paramount. So what do we do about this? Well, it just so happens that slower ships are safer ships for whales. So uh, since 2007, we've been, uh, NOAA, um, has, my agency, along with um, uh, many other partners, have been trying to get in, fr in front of this problem, and we've been issuing a voluntary, underscore, voluntary seasonal management zone in the channel when the whales appear. And working with the Coast Guard, we broadcast this notice, and um, you don't need to read all of this, but we advise the ships to slow down to 10 knots when the whales are present. Typically, as you know from the whale watch industry around here, May through November is when we have the great whales return. And uh, when the whales leave, we pull the notice. And uh, the Coast Guard's been helping us get this notice out. We've been working with the shipping agencies, uh, the shipping lines, 
um, to advise their captains that the seasonal uh, whale zone is in effect. And uh, we happen to track all the ships, and I'll get to that later, how we do that, right from the harbor. And so since 2007, we've been doing this. And in uh, analyzing uh, whether there's been any cooperation, and I purposely use that word cooperation, not compliance. Again, this is not a regulatory program. This is a non-regulatory, voluntary approach. Uh, if you look at the, the, the black line heading down, that shows the 10 knot recommendation that we've been making. And all the bars on the graphs to the right of it show the average speeds of ships. Uh, that's, this is just a three year sample. Um, and so we've had virtually zero cooperation. So ships are not slowing down. And um, this is not surprising. This, a voluntary program, um, uh, there's pretty low expectations. And in working with the industry, uh, they need to make the port call. So they're not going to slow down. And um, we've been trying this for, we're going on six years now with a voluntary approach. It's not working. And so what we, um, and just to demonstrate, uh, and, and you are all welcome to this information that's actually collected right from the harbor with a radio antenna on top of the waterfront center. Uh, we stream the, the signals coming from every ship uh, in the channel uh, right into the building and we can determine who they are, how fast they're going, um, where they're going. And uh, you see that the traffic is not only in the channel and it's nice to see it really dark there in those traffic separation scheme uh, that's been established, but a lot of traffic outside the channel as Mary mentioned. Uh, a lot of that traffic was driven out there by the uh, clean fuel regulations. So the ships were going around the islands to stay outside and, and burn the cheaper fuel. Uh, I'm, I might add for another Harbor Commission discussion, that concerns us greatly, having traffic out there that is not within a traffic separation scheme. Um, so tracking ships, tracking whales, and um, voluntary approach is not working. So that leads us to uh, what we believe is a solution. Thanks, Sean. Christy Burney with the Environmental Defense Center, and we sit on the Channel Islands Sanctuary Advisory Council. And so in 2007, when we had those ship strikes, our organization became very involved in the issue and have been working on it since. And it's exciting to be here with this partnership and looking at vessel speed reduction. What's impressive about this option is it's not a new one. It's being used successfully down in the ports of Long Beach in LA. They have an existing program they call the Green Flags Program. And you'll see on um, the slide there, it designates a 40 and 20 nautical mile zone. And those are areas where they voluntarily ask ships to slow down to improve air quality at the ports. And they have over 90% compliance with this voluntary program. And they provide financial incentives to get ships to participate. So we've really looked at this program as a model. If you go to the next slide, Mayor Bershon, thanks. And this has really informed our proposal. What, what we're talking about is the extending this program up through the ports of, or from the ports up through the Santa Barbara Channel. We're proposing to do it in a phased approach. So years one and two, we'd be looking at developing the program, looking at the incentives that would need to be provided, what sort of greenhouse gas emissions we would get from this program, how we would track it, just kind of tightening up a lot of the existing resources we have. And then phase two would be rolling this out to the state of California. If you go to the next slide. So as we've talked about, um, this is a complex issue. And so we saw an opportunity looking at the state cap and trade funds to potentially find funding to make this happen. And the state has put together a three-year investment plan. And when we went and looked at that plan, we got very excited because a lot of the criteria and goals of that plan we have in our, our vessel speed reduction initiative. Some of them include you know, significant greenhouse gas reductions. And so that's kind of the, the crux of these funds. It aligns with the state's clean transportation and sustainable freight strategies. It also provides for the regional collaboratives that we've talked about, and there are multiple co-benefits. It's rare when you have a single policy mechanism that provides so many co-benefits, and so I'm going to talk a bit more about that. And for Santa Barbara and California in general, as you've heard, there's air quality benefits for humans, so we reduce toxins. 
and particulates in the air. There's also a business component to this. There's the near-term NOx emission reductions that we're looking for locally, and this would help reduce um, some of the constraints that local businesses are under right now because they are a regulated source. And again, it gets back at kind of what Mary was talking about, these NOx emission reductions for Santa Barbara County. And it, these emission reductions would occur across all the coastal communities, so not just Santa Barbara. And the final one Sean highlighted, this whale protection. The science has really shown that if you slow ships down, you reduce the lethality of a collision, and, and if there is a collision, the severity of that collision is reduced. And we've seen this type of um, management strategy used in other places on the East Coast to protect the right whale. So this really is a, a very nice, eloquent solution to, to many of the problems we're facing. So this is my favorite slide. Um, it's something that I've gotten really excited about and I'm very proud to be involved in the outreach and energy momentum we've created with this idea and concept has just been incredible. We've been, we've been working really hard over the last couple months to generate education and outreach and support. So we've been talking to the California Air Resources Board and other state agencies. We've been attending hearings and meetings, submitting lots of letters. We've gotten letters of support from a wide range of stakeholders. These are all the people that are gonna be infected. The, we've specifically gotten letters of support from the city of Santa Barbara, Marist Shipping Line, the U.S. Navy, California Coastal Commission, Ocean Protection Council. There's a whole list. Um, and then recently we had a six-day push to get letters of support from the community and we got over 280 letters from the community. So this is an effort that is gaining momentum at many levels and we feel like we're doing the, the good outreach to make sure we we reach out and educate people and also gather input and, and take their input. We're working with the ports um, on developing this program so that it would align with their existing program. The time frame. So this is where it gets exciting and has been particularly exciting this week. The governor released his proposed budget on Wednesday and we initially had thought that there would be money allocated for the cap and trade auction funds in that budget. And what he has decided to propose instead is that those money, um, monies get loaned a one-time shot to the general fund of the budget and not be used for cap and trade funding um, projects. So we are kind of scrambling around like everybody else trying to figure out this is the first time we've, the state has had cap and trade funding and so it's the first time that we've dealt with this money and um, I think everyone's trying to figure out how they're gonna use it and where it's gonna go. So now that budget goes through the legislative budget process. So it's now going to subcommittees, um, both in the state and the assembly, and they will determine how they, if they like that plan or not. And the final budget should come out in June. If you go to the last slide, perfect. So what are we doing? So we're basically, I mean, this is a bit of a black box. So we're learning as we go. And we're just continuing to, to bang the drum <laughs> and really try to raise awareness about how great this program is. And we're encouraging, you know, working with the agencies that will decide how funding is used. And we're just continuing to pursue support for it. We're also looking at other funding sources and we're keeping all op options open. And then locally, we definitely will be working to make sure that this vessel speed reduction initiative gets in the state legislative platforms. Because right now it talks about air quality and marine shipping, but it doesn't specifically mention vessel speed reduction. So we'll be working with the city and the, the county level for that. Um, with that, I think that's, is that our last slide? Perfect. So we are very appreciative of the opportunity to come today and talk to you about this effort. Um, it's just been a pleasure to work on. We think that there is a lot of momentum and opportunities and, you know, I guess our ask would be looking for any opportunities that you guys may have to support it. Um, any ideas, suggestions, we're open to them. Again, we've been reaching out to people to really solicit ideas and support. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for the fascinating report. Uh, uh, Commissioners, Commissioner Spicer. Thank you for your report. I'm, I'm a fan of all the agencies and uh, alumni of the Channel Islands. Uh, National Marine Sanctuary. Um, forgive me, although I do have a naive question. Um, on the slide you showed of all the traffic, um, 
What is the difference in time from a ship going through the channel at 10 knots versus 25 knots? If you could just ballpark it, please. About four hours. So that it would increase their time uh, in the channel. And um, surprising to it, I don't think it's um, a, a simple question. Actually, I, I had the same one. What, what does that mean? Um, and it, what I've learned from, from Mary's shop is uh, the slower you go, you, you greatly reduce the air emissions. The engines run more efficiently um, as you get down to about 12 knots. It depends on the size of the ship. But, um, and, and with that, a corollary effect on the severity of ship strikes on whales. And so speed really is the key here, slowing them down, uh, even though they'd be spending more time in the channel as they approach the port. Um, and, and that's one of the complications is these ships do have um, port calls that they have to make. And so um, th what, the, what the port realized with this Green Ports program, and there was a lot of obstinance to slowing down the ships even within 20 miles or 40 miles of the port when they first proposed it, you, you adjust the clock. Um, and so it was rather easy, actually, uh, once there was buy-in, once there was a financial incentive to slow down, um, and the, from the longshoremen to the trucks and the trains, they just adjusted their clock an hour or two, um, and the system moves forward. So we are, ask, we are asking for the system, the, inter, the entire intermodal system, to slow down and adjust, this, adjust the clock another four or five hours. Um, ma majority of the traffic that's coming through the channel is coming from Asia. And uh, d again, depending on the ship, that's a 14-day trip. So 14 hour, uh, four hours is, we need to keep it relative and put it in perspective of what that actually means. Uh, Commissioner Batlin. I just want to say thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's it's been a little frustrating, I know, for some of the local governments that, uh, you know, one of our biggest, well, actually our biggest uh, pollution source, we haven't really been able to tackle. Um, so I just want to applaud you for this uh, effort. I originally saw the presentation by Maersk, uh, I believe in 2011 it was. Um, and so I know they're on board and they're a leader in uh, slow steaming. Are, are others joining on board? I know that they've, you know, adjusted their schedules for that accordingly, but are we seeing other um, uh, companies join on? With, with this particular initiative, uh, we've been working with the ports, um, as mentioned, and the Pacific Merchant Shipping Association and uh, PMSA. They represent a uh, high percentage, upwards of 90 percent of the container traffic calling on, on California ports. Uh, we are in close collaboration with them, and they, uh, I would put it as tacit support. Um, they're not writing letters and, and endorsing it, uh, but they realize uh, because of, and if you recall the slide where I showed the voluntary cooperation where we have not received any, they realize between that and regulation is a short distance. And so an incentive-based program that would be voluntary um, is very appealing to them. Um, so again, I'd put it at about tacit support. Um, and. Uh, they're sort of sitting back and watching to see what happens. I, I, what's really important is that Maersk is behind this. As you noted, the largest shipping line in the world um, and a huge shipping line calling on the ports. Where they lead, others follow. That's what we've seen with other shipping initiatives. Thanks for that. And just uh, one follow-up question. Uh, with the programs in uh, L.A. and Long Beach, do we know about how much? Obviously, their scale is kind of not even comparable to ours, but what are you looking at? What's your goal funding-wise for this program? Well, that, that's one of the things that would have to be determined, but I uh, think you're on our list for our marine shipping solutions group. Uh, we had a presentation that was a kind of a tag team but from the Port of L.A., and also an emissions specialist in shipping emissions who helped craft their incentive program. So he hit, one of his points was it doesn't have to pay their full cost because they get other benefits from participating in this program. There are green, the green flag benefit. Uh, the ports have a whole program of giving publicity to the ships that are participating. So that's one of the areas we'd have to figure out. We have a full implementation plan that we developed, that we submitted to the state when we submitted our full proposal. And if you go to our website, sbcapcd.org, we have marine shipping initiatives highlighted, and you can just go right to the page and see 
the full implementation plan. What we we feel the ports have been able to do it with I think it's one to two million um, each one per year. Ours would obviously have to be more. Um, that's why this cap and trade auction revenue pot of funding was appealing to us because that that's a significant amount of funding and it's des designated to get greenhouse gas emission reductions, which our program would do, plus also get air quality co-benefits, which our program would clearly do. So, uh, you know, the answer is it could be five million for the pilot program, it could be more for the state program, but that would be one of the things we would focus on in the very first year would be meeting with the shipping companies, meeting with the ports, getting an expert like similar to the one who came and spoke to us about that. And I just wanted to point one thing out about Maersk is that they have been, we've had regular conversations with them as we've developed this program. And we've reached out to other people who are looking at shipping, including the European Environment Agency, which is looking at identifying reducing greenhouse gases from ships as well. So we, we're on kind of always asking for uh, advice and, and thoughts on this. Um. Uh, Commissioner Kelly. Yes. Very fascinating report, and thank you for, for bringing it in. I'm just going to ask a question and see if there's any nexus in all the stuff. If we're adding four hours to about a 14-day trip, we're getting a little more than a 1% plus transit time, time being money. Do we have any idea if that much merchandise is moving and the cost, what that actually adds as a factor to cost? So working with the uh, Bren School at UC Santa Barbara, we actually, um, and, and one of their, um, their, their economists, we, we ran a cost-benefit analysis through one of their, their graduate school courses and uh, re received 12 different cost-benefit analyses that we're, we're pouring through right now. And so the answer is yes, we do have an idea of, the, of what, the, the, uh, uh, what time costs to a ship. Um, balanced though with the, uh, um, um, it needs to be balanced with the fuel savings that they um, would receive from slowing down. And what we've also learned is 50 to 60 percent of their operating costs is fuel. So um, I don't have a single answer for you. Um, we have quite a bit of research on that. And, and as Mary noted, and as the ports have learned in their incentive program, you're not actually compensating them for any additional costs that additional time on the water. Um, means. Uh, what you're doing is offering a tax break, a wharfage reduction fee, uh, perhaps a, a cash incentive, um, and, and the cash incentives are on the order of $10,000. Um, so not a huge amount of money when some of these ships are carrying upwards of a billion dollars worth of goods. But what really matters and why the port program has been successful is because of that greening of the industry. Uh, the industry recognizes its impact and we all recognize how much we depend on the industry. So this is a way for them to say, we're, we're doing our best and, and we're, you're, you're, they're being recognized for doing so. Um, but if you're interested in the details, I'm happy to share those or, or bring those. Um, it, it's quite extensive body of work. Thank you. No, I just was aware that it's a, it's a very complicated, uh, very complicated issue and that the dollars are huge. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Webb. Uh, thank you for your report and your collaboration and, and doing the work. Um, this summer, um, am I to understand that the shipping lanes are going to be moved and then the separation zone, um, what, a mile instead of two? Um, how effective do you feel this, this change will be for this? I, I'm really glad you brought it up. I was trying to figure out a way to weave it into the, the, the meeting tonight um, because it is a big change for our region. And as you noted, uh, working with the International Maritime or through the International Maritime Organization, uh, my agency, NOAA, and the Coast Guard uh, recommended and the IMO approved uh, the, the adjustment to the traffic separation scheme. And you're correct in that the two-mile separation between the northbound and the southbound lanes will be reduced to one mile of separation and the southbound lane, which is closest to the island, runs parallel to the islands, will be moving north uh, one mile into what was the, the former separation area. And um, 
this is a, a prudent measure that does, um, it's determined by the Coast Guard and IMO to uh, first and foremost uh, maintain safety of navigation. And secondly, and one of the reasons we were behind it was to move the lane off of and away from a, uh, the 200 meter isobath, which we, is near as we can tell with uh, about a decade's worth of data, appears to be the preferred habitat of these feeding whales when they're here um, in the summertime. And so with the majority of sightings of whales in, on that bathymetric feature and the lane having run over that is where the whales appear to be getting run over. So um, we, we believe it does add, add a measure of conservation um, for the whales. A mile is not a very long way for an 80-foot animal. Um, however, if there's no food in the shipping lane, you're not usually gonna find the whales there. Uh, they do move. Um, I hesitate, again, to put a, a number on the percentage of conservation offered by this, but it, um, the agencies at, um, at the federal level believe this is a step in the right direction. Uh, the, it means no additional transit time or cost to industry. Industry was fine with it, and it was approved by the international body. That said, we, we seek this body's support and help in getting the word out um, because the big ships will learn this through the Coast Guard. Um, we're, we're concerned about our harbor community and the boaters that transit over to the, to the islands and to the sanctuary. So through, through our listserv, we've been putting the notice out because we want people to know these lanes are changing and be safe and, and be aware that if you're, it's not two miles of, of separation, it's one. Um, so we're open to ideas. We want to partner um, with the Harbor Commission um, and, and uh, any partner of the waterfront to get the word out so people continue to enjoy the islands in, in a safe manner. There'll have to be a lot of updated charts and um, uh, GPS uh, info. Thank you. Um, again, thank you for that report. I, uh, I was over at APCD a couple months ago when, when you had that, and it's great to get a refresher on it. Uh, two questions. And, uh, one is um, how can we, I know the city of Santa Barbara has signed on, but I'd like for us as a commission to, to sign on as well so you can have 281 letters instead of 280. Um, but then in terms of the, the new one mile distance, uh, if you could bring that back maybe next month or the month after, just what are the plans for outreach to the harbor community? Uh, if you have that now, great, but if you need some time uh, to come back with that, I'd love to understand how we're outreaching. Uh, to our local community because I think it's very important for safety and, and to get the word out. Commissioner Sloan. Yeah, again, thank you for the very informative report. I just, um, have you looked at the safety to the commercial and recreational boaters going out to the islands and everything? Because granted, the ships are going slower, but now they're spending twice as much time in the channel. So is it, have you looked at that or thought about that at all or how we educate people or what, how we handle it? Um, so this, this entire process we've described this evening has gone through the advisory council and, and as many of you know, there's a lot of different interests around the table, um, and commercial and recreational and, and uh, research and education. And so um, we have thought about it and, and to note that the ships actually aren't slowing down yet. We hope they do. Um, and um, so there's been a lot of perspective, a lot of input on it and generally um, and uh, almost unanimous support for for moving the lanes, for slowing the ships down, because of all the benef uh, benefits. And, and I have to believe, and, and you all would probably know better than I do, but with, um, with most, most boaters and ships carrying the technology they do, um, there's a high level of awareness uh, out there when they're trying to get across those lanes um, or if there's someone crossing in front of their paths. It's, it's a very astute point, and we're, again, all ears to issues and concerns and ways of addressing um, because, uh, again, paramount the safety of navigation to the big ships and the little ones. Right, right. And then I just had one quick follow-up question. That AIS data that you showed, is that all ships or are those just the, the large uh, commercial ships? Th those are all, that slide showed you all ships that carry transponders. Okay. Um, so anything over 60 feet or what, what's the requirement for AIS? Um, so I, I believe it is over 60 feet, but that is changing or it's been suggested that that will change and, and smaller vessels um, uh, may be uh, like the like charter vessels uh, may be required to carry um, AIS in the future. 
Uh, but this, those are mostly the big, the big ships. And all the track lines you saw inside of the traffic separation scheme, most of that's um, uh, oil service boats moving between um, the rigs. Right, and that was it. We saw a whole bunch inside the shipping lanes, and I wanted to make sure everybody knew that they weren't the big ships coming <laughs> real yes. close at night. Yes, you know, thank no. you for pointing that out. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. The, the, uh, thank you very, very much for the report. It's exciting to see the collaboration between the, the county and the EDC and the, and the sanctuary. And uh, I'm sure you'll be letting the staff know whatever has been happening, and you'll let us know. Is that correct? And thank you. And, uh, next item on our agenda is uh, amendments to the parking ordinance. And Jeanette, would you read, please, the staff recommendation? Recommendation that Harbor Commission <coughs> consider proposed changes to ordinances governing 72-hour parking in waterfront lots and recommend approval of those changes to City Council. We have four requests for speaking, and I presume that should come after the uh, staff report? Or? Madam Chair, I suggest we take the staff report first and then an any questions from the Commission of Staff and then go through the uh, public comment and then continue from there. Thank you. Mr. Conman? Madam Chair and Staff, excuse me, Madam Chair and Commissioners, uh, I wanted to make a clarification before I begin, and it's a sort of a clarification slash apology. Um, apparently, the uh, title of this, the subject line title of this report, Amendments to Parking Ordinance 72-Hour Limit, though we thought it was clear that this pertains only to what we're suggesting here tonight and what this report is about, pertains only to the general red permits sold to the public and, in an ancillary fashion, people who pulled tickets from the, the, the uh, ticket spitters in the uh, harbor lots. There was apparently some misunderstanding in the harbor community. This pertained to the blue slip holder permits, and I want to let you know right at the top uh, that this, there's nothing in this report really that deals with blue permits. What this is, you'll hear in a moment as I go through the report, this is a, an extension of the direction we've been headed, the direction that was um, um, uh, started at the parking committee level, and the direction that the public asked us to go in, but it has, has nothing to do with the blue slipholder permits. So by way of background, back in January, as most of us know, the Harbor Commission formed a three-member parking committee, and uh, at public meetings in February and March, that, permit, per, uh, excuse me, that committee did direct staff to um, look, at, look at ways that we could go about um, uh, enforcing what was already on the books, basically all the rules and regulations pertaining to the 72-hour uh, limits in the main harbor lot especially. So uh, in doing that, um, what, we've, what, what has happened is uh, we've issued a total of 36 citations for 72-hour violations between March 18th and May 5th, and uh, only one in the final month of that period. So um, it's really dropped off dramatically. I think we got people's attention. Um, I think the lot is visually different. I think we're making progress. And uh, what you're going to hear tonight is along the lines of advancing that progress and continuing to tighten up rules that are already on the books. So while enforcing the 72-hour limit, um, there have been situations that, that were brought to our attention that made us look back at the ordinances, made us look back at the parking uh, laws in Title 17 of the Municipal Code to see what they said and see how they could be amended to help us advance what our direction was in terms of the 72-hour limits. For example, the first one was an individual appealed a citation uh, that he received after he had rolled his vehicle from one parking stall to another. And he said, I was in compliance with the law, which we're going to discuss in a minute with some PowerPoint slides. Um, and, and it was our belief that this certainly wasn't keeping if he, even if it was keeping with the letter of the law, it certainly wasn't keeping with the spirit of the law. Uh, he c contested that citation. It went up to the police department. I don't know what the, G the adjudication of that was. We, we rarely find that out. But we wanted to change the, um, the municipal code, amend the code, to reflect the fact that people should, after 72 hours, leave the lot. Okay, we're going to get to that in a minute, and I'll show you the exact language we're proposing. And all this language we're going to show you tonight is draft language. Um, we welcome your comments on it. 
Ultimately, we're going to get together with the city attorney's office and make sure we're doing the right thing legally. And if there are any substantive changes, we'll come back to you before we go to ordinance committee and ultimately city council. The second, uh, the second issue that arose was uh, related to the outer lots, not just the harbor main lot, but uh, all the outer lots uh, in the greater waterfront have a, uh, a closure between 2 and 6 a.m. You can't park there between 2 and 6 a.m. You'll get tickets. This includes the Cabrillos, Palm Park, Garden Street, Ledbetter, Harbor West, and what have you. The interesting thing is um, some people have chosen to park in there and stay in there, and they, while accumulating tickets, uh, we had no enforcement tool to get them out of there after 72 hours. There is a mechanism after they accumulate, I believe, I believe it's either five or six tickets, they get what's called a hope tow, and we can get the police down there to tow them out, but they actually have to be towed between the hours of two and six when they're, when they're uh, in violation. But um, so as opposed to after 72 hours, if we had the 72-hour limit applied to all the outer lots the way it's applied to the main harbor lot, then we would have uniformity and we would be able to tow uh, nuisance vehicles out after two citations and not five or six. So that was the second issue. And finally, there was some antiquated ordinance language that I'm going to share with you, and I'll explain that when we get to it, but we just believe it needs to be deleted. So let's take a look at what we're proposing here. Uh, in Title 1736-040, under 72-hour vehicle parking limit, what we'd like to do is we would like to strike. The strike-throughs are obviously what we want to delete. The underscores are what we'd like to add. Um, what we're suggesting here is that we'd like to uh, apply the 72-hour vehicle parking limit, not just in the main harbor lot, but to all the waterfront lots. And so that's the first thing you see at the top. By doing so, we're able to tow nuisance abandoned vehicles in a much uh, briefer time than, uh, than otherwise is the case. So the next language um, basically uh, relates to the, to the rolling of a car from one stall to another or moving it just a short distance. So the black language is existing language. The strike through is what we want to strike, and the underscore is what we would add. So basically, what it currently says is that no person who owns or has possession, custody, or control of any vehicle shall park, stop, or leave that vehicle. And now it says in the same parking space in the harbor parking lot. So a person can argue, it wasn't in the same space. I rolled it to the next space which certainly isn't in keeping with what we as staff believe is the intent of the enforcement of our 72-hour limits. So we are proposing striking that language and adding any, parking any waterfront parking lot. So what that would mean would be that after 72 hours, an individual would have to move it out of the lot and back into the lot if they so chose to remain in compliance with the 72-hour limit. It could mean they move it from one parking lot to another parking lot, it could mean they get out on the boulevard and take a trip to the dry cleaner, but it doesn't. It means you can't just move it from one stall to another. You would have to leave the lot in which it was parked. Going down to B, uh, any person wishing to park a vehicle in the harbor parking lot over 72 hours may be allowed to do so, providing the first part is already exists. We know that we have a system for asking for extra time to stay in the waterfront lot. But the second part, number two, is antiquated language that suggests that if you pay in advance an appropriate daily parking fee for all the days you intend to remain in the lot, you can stay there as long as you want. Well, this never was the intention of um, enforcement of the 72-hour rule. Uh, it sort of parallels what we have with, slip perm with visiting uh, boats. We are allowed to stay for 28 days. That ordinance is only about five years old. There used to be, uh, it used to be the case where a person could uh, uh, rent a visitor slip in the harbor and stay as long as they wanted, as long as they paid the increasing fees and rates. If you were a millionaire, you could stay all year wrong, long, which really wasn't doing a service to our visiting public. The same concept is what we're proposing and advancing here, that striking this language means you can't just pay in advance and stay as long as you want in a harbor parking lot. The second and final slide here this evening uh, deals with penalties for parking in the 
uh, harbor uh, parking lot. And what we want to do is we want to just change that to any waterfront lot. It's really a simple uh, grammatical change just to, comp just to make it extended to all the, uh, all the waterfront lots that I noted before. And, um, and also a change down below that the vehicle may be sighted and any member of the police department authorized by the chief of police may remove the vehicle from that parking lot. In other words, again, extending it from just the harbor parking lot to any waterfront lot. So in conclusion, Again, this only deals with 72-hour uh, parking issues, but we believe this, these amendments will help clarify the code. We believe they're in keeping with the direction we've gotten both from the parking committee and from the public. And I would note that we met with the parking committee to discuss these issues on May 8th and that we got uh, their unanimous support to move forward with these ordinance changes. That concludes my report. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much for the report. I guess we'll have questions and then have call and public comment. Uh, uh, Commissioner Kelly, has a question? Yeah. Mick, I just had one question. And in your earlier comments before you gave the presentation, you made a comment about overstaying the 72 hours and then they could only be towed between 2 and 6, the time of the tow. I don't see that addressed. Does that need to be addressed? It's, I, th I think it's, pol it's practice and pattern and practice with the police department. And they're usually they're they're too busy between two and six to come down and tow vehicles. But it's a police department thing. Yeah, this will be this will make it if it's a, if there's a 72 hour limit in all the lots, then somebody gets ticketed a couple times. We can get them towed out any time of the day or night. It'll, it'll really be a help for for the blight down at the waterfront of abandoned vehicles. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner Spicer. Uh, thank you, Mick. Um, I just have a a question of clarification. Um, we're talking about the individual that rolled their vehicle from one space to the other, and so you're changing that. So in the letter of the law, they can leave the parking lot and make a U-turn outside the gate and come right back in and park in a different stall. Is that correct? Madam Chair, Commissioner Spicer, that's correct. What we're proposing, what we're proposed, by what we're proposing, what you just described is correct. We have five uh, public comments, uh, speakers. The first would be Stephen Lee Bur um, Bird, uh, to be followed by Jane Doe. Uh, Mr. Bird, I have two yes. minutes. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, excuse me? We have two minutes, please. Two minutes? Yes. Two minutes, public comment. I, I can't. Uh condense what I have to say into two minutes. Um. You know, I've, I've listened respectfully to everybody else here time after time, and to say two minutes is just um, How long do you very, think uh, is your presentation? I, I don't believe that's very consistent at all. Um. <laughs> Mr. Bird, how long do you believe you would take? Eight minutes. I think you condensed down to five. I in the can interest, try, but in I'm, the interest I'm, of I'm the still, other people I'm that are here, I'm still confused about what, even what the uh, what the proposal is because the proposal is different than what was um, than what was um, proposed before. There were restrictions proposed before for the blue sil slip holders permits, and. Um, and uh, I'm confused about whether those have been delayed or they're not going to be pressed at all now or what? Uh, as far as I know, the item that's on the agenda is specifically to do with the, this particular 72-hour permit, the red permit. Uh, and, and anything else is not on the agenda at this point. Well, but it, uh, are there restrictions for the blue slip holders permits at, at, a, at a later point? Or, uh, or? That I don't know. Well, that. Uh, can but, somebody from the committee uh, or, or but, staff uh, address that um, concern? Uh, Mr. Reedman is the waterfront director. Huh. But it's sort uh, of Madam Chair, for the last few months we've been discussing these parking issues with the parking committee at several public meetings and all the Harbor Commission meetings since January. And at the present time, we are, we are uh, forwarding no recommendations involving the blue permits whatsoever. 
there's nothing on the table tonight. There hasn't been anything from on the table, and uh, we don't have a timetable in which case, in, at what time we would be bringing forward any changes to the blue permits. Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm very gratified that that uh, seems to be the case, but that is news. Uh, that is very much news. That's good news uh, for me um, because I was very concerned about how I don't fit a traditional profile in the harbor, and then this, this only seemed to be aimed at an earlier point toward people that fit certain preconceived profiles. And, um, yeah, but, uh, um, and so I, I wanted to uh, underline to you about um, how I didn't fit into the traditional profiles and, and also how there are very serious um, questions about what type of government this is uh, if uh, you know if these measures were being considered, and I, th I thought that it might be still uh, very instructive to go through that, uh, you know, just so that we get some sense of how important some of these issues are. Because I don't think the issues were t being taken with the with the measure of gravity that they should. Um, so. Um, as we said, my name is Stephen Bird, and I've lived on my traditionally designed mahogany plank cutter rig sloop as my primary residence in Santa Barbara Harbor since 1974, some 40 years now. I was a member of this board of harbor commissioners in the late 1970s and 1980s, serving as the chair of the Budget Review Committee, Liveaboard Review Policy Committee, numerous lease and other committees, and vice chair contemporaneous with Dan Secourt. And at the same time, I've also had my 1956 Volkswagen bus since I was 16 years old in, in 1964. And since my exclusive residence has been my sailboat in Santa Barbara Harbor, this vehicle has been parked in the Santa Barbara Harbor parking lot almost continuously since 1974. Since 1980, I've had two vehicles when my grandmother gave me her classic Mustang when she got too old to drive around anymore. Being only one person, I can only drive one vehicle at a time. That means the other vehicle will have to stay parked at my primary residence, which necessarily means the Santa Barbara Harbor parking lot. My dilemma now is that I do not fit into the tightly regimented bureaucratic pigeonholes that our staff has conjured up or in, in previous proposals at an earlier point, such as a meeting that I attended in February that, they, that, they, that seemed to be conjured up at that point. But I'm, but I'm very glad that those don't seem to be pressed right now. Neither do I fit the stereotype profile of the weekend yachtsman who only has Saturday and Sunday off and maybe two vacation weeks of vacation a year to use his boat in the harbor. I'm now 65 years old and retired. That leaves me with a wherewithal to follow up on my commitment to keep my 90-year-old mother with advanced Alzheimer's in an independent living and to avoid having her institutionalized in a regimented lock facility. That means going out of county hundreds of miles away to another part of California 12 to 14 days every month to provide adult supervision to her taking turns with my brother. I've also taken the occasion to travel extensively overland in Mexico, scoping out the possibility of basing my primary residence there someday. I put on some 25,000 miles in road trips through 14 states of Mexico in five trips in the last three years alone. Needless to say, with these commitments and priorities, it has left me with less than 25% of the time to come back home to Santa Barbara currently. For example, last winter between December 15th and April 12th, I was here in Santa Barbara just one day, one and a half days, and, and 11 days. I need the freedom and flexibility to be away from home 75% plus of the time currently, and to be secure in my home my possessions, and my person while I'm away. And that's, that's what I felt was lacking here. And if I'm asked to dispose of my commitment to my 90-year-old mother with advanced Alzheimer's or to the VW bus I've had for virtually 50 years since my youth, this will end very badly. I will take that exceedingly, exceedingly personally. Let's be frank in what the problem is here. We chase the problem around and around and around in nuts and bolts, left brain sense, and we can never quite pin down exactly what the problem was with these vans. Mr. Bird, but, the time is moving along. It's somewhat more than five minutes at this point, please. Um, 
Well, I have I have a lot uh, to other to say, and I think that it's a lot more important than a lot that that has been well, said I'm not tonight. Sure there are the four people waiting. But, Perhaps but I you think, could. I think the most egregious thing of all was the personal attack in the Santa Barbara Independent by the waterfront director on on me personally, unprovoked attack in, in the uh, March 14th uh, Santa Barbara Independent. Thank you for your comment, uh, Jane Doe. Is the next speaker, please. Madam Chair and Two minutes Parker also, please. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciated what this uh, gentleman just said, and it's a very good example of the uncertainty and confusion that's out there in our harbor community. Um, we are sort of left with this uncertainty of what's going to happen with the blue parking stickers. Uh, when I was here <coughs> last month, I'm sorry, I'm a little out of breath. It, it's, it exerts me just to walk from there to here because of my respiratory problem. When I was here last month, I said that I would be meeting with Scott Reedman on April 25th, and I did. We had a cordial meeting. We were able to have a little bit of humor even in the conversation. Um, but I asked him, I said that Commissioner Frank Kelly made an excellent suggestion. Why don't, ha why don't, he have the, why don't they have the red parking sticker people, all of them, take a timed parking sticker out of the, when they go through, as he called it, the ticket spitter. Mr. Reedman said that he didn't want to uh, utilize that um, as a tool because it would add confusion to people who are used to being able to go through there, and he didn't want to tie up traffic if somebody wanted to dispute it. But we go through that in every city parking lot here, and the city uses them all over. I think it was an excellent suggestion. I think it would alleviate a lot of problems, and it's a tool that's not being used. Um, I asked him what he thought about uh, my suggestion that we have um, some kind of reward system for like the first 10 people who would voluntarily get their problematic vehicles off a $75 one time only reduction. He said he wasn't sure if that was an effective way to use city funds and then what, how do you prevent them from turning right around and putting the vehicle in there? Well, one, I think it would be in a very effective way to use city funds and I and I pointed out when I was here last, he was spending advertising dollars still sending, selling parking stickers when we're having a problem. And part of, part of the agreement would be they would have to relinquish that uh, blue parking sticker when they pulled out, that the city could just, I mean, the harbor department could go down and physically remove the sticker. Could you move on? up? It's getting a little bit more beyond two minutes, please. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Talk as quick as I can. Um, that um, I, I enjoyed. Clock timer right there on the diet podium. I oh, believe. I had it covered. I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, uh, I, I enjoyed the slide of all the wonderful people who went down and, and worked to clean up the harbor. If I was more physically fit, I would have joined. Um, but I wonder how many of those wonderful people hold blue parking stickers. There are so many ways. One, one solution that I hadn't brought up before, but. Um, T target the, the problematic vehicles and let those people know that they're not going to be reissued a blue parking sticker because of, for whatever the reason is, instead of penalizing our entire community. And, and the last thing that I want to emphasize, well, two last quick things. Um, we need an end date to this. We can't have it holding over our heads. Lorraine and I work very hard on the petition. We probably have about 90 names, but the majority of a lot of boat and slip owners still don't know about this. And um, I would like you to all, if you have the time, to read the Doc Lines article. Uh, Mr. Reedman said I accused him of hiding the blue parking sticker, sticker issue. Uh, that's not what I said. I said it's not in there. It's very, very different. It's not in there. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, next speaker will be Linda Lowell, please, to be followed by uh, Mary Williamson. Thank you for your time. Um, just as a very quick aside, um, I really doubt there's any millionaire in this city who would like to park their vehicle year-round in the parking lot, I, I just think. Um, however, it seems to me there are four factions in this parking dilemma. The first is the Harbor and the Harbor Commission, and uh, they indicated that there was a crowding problem. But they also admitted that there wasn't effective data complied, um, compiled at that point. I would submit that it should at least be a year's worth of uh, collecting data before any stringent changes took place. 
The second faction uh, is a group that seems to find some vehicles an eyesore. I mentioned two meetings ago, which was the only other meeting I could attend, that um, I found it very problematic that we were having some form of beauty police establishing. If, if the Department of Motor Vehicles has deemed a vehicle um, worthy of registration, I think it, that's the end of that matter. Uh, the third faction, I think, is a group of uh, people who cruise, whether they be Yaakov members or not, and their concerns seem to be one, two, or three-week periods of time. The fourth group, of which um, I am a member periodically, is um, the liveaboard community. These are the mostly the least um, um, economically advantaged people in the city of Santa Barbara. They're living on their boats for economic reasons. Um, I happened to mention at the meeting I was at um, two meetings ago that I leave for the summers. And um, it was a big decision to move on my boat so that I could leave my one person, one car in the harbor. It um, is coming close to two minutes. It's beyond Thank two you minutes, very much. I, I'm closing. Um, I understand at the next meeting I was somewhat mischaracterized as someone who just um, goes away for the summer as if it was some kind of um, um, a frivolous event. I worked 10 months at City College. I worked two months uh, on the East Coast. So, but I don't think it should be a matter of why I was personally affronted to hear that it seemed as if my opinions were being dismissed based on um, this sense that I was uh, perhaps a dilettante who just takes the summers off. I think that anybody's opinion should be honored and not dismissed, and I appreciate your time. I would add one final comment that I think when it comes to liveaboard people, that there should be a clause that gives them grandfather status. If you're going to make any kind of huge change that affects people that are living on their boats, then I believe the people who are in the current system should be given a, a grandfather clause, and I thank you for your time. Thank you for your comment. And uh, next speaker, uh, it's uh, Mark, Mark, Mark Williamson. Mark Williamson. Oh, apologies, Madam Mayor, um, Council Members. Could you put the municipal code up on the screen for me? Oh, thanks. I'll, I'll get right to the point. We're going to look at um, 173604, and let's go down until B1. And um, there's two words that I'd like to bring to your attention and one is registers and the other is prior. Now we don't know what that means at this point. It's not in the code and they have a system in place and I don't know what the system is and I don't know if you know what the system is but register would to me be a telephone call with the pertinent information. I'm leaving town I won't be back until four days. Another way to do it would be to email or walk up to the waterfront department if you're in that area. Um, there are some fishermen that live out in Goleta, for example, that don't have a blue permit. I would hate to have them to come in to the harbor office to register possibly a day before they go out and be gone for more than 72 hours. It's one thing to consider. The other word is prior. What is what is the time frame of prior? Is it a day before? Is it um, an hour before I leave town? So the, I think to make this municipal code work, I think that should be in there so the public really knows what it is. And uh, so before it goes to uh, the, uh, the city attorney and before it's drafted, I think, I think we should have some clarity on that. Any questions? Yeah. Thank you for your comment. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, may I offer a point of clarification? Sure. The writing in black uh, uh, it has been on the books for a couple of decades. Um, that's not proposed writing. That's not, that's not proposed language. 
Um, that's existing language in the municipal code. And typically we honor anything prior to somebody leaving town. I'm going on a fishing trip. I'm going cruising. I'm going to see my grandmother. If it's with it, we have a, we have a form at the, at the desk at the Harbor Patrol office, at the waterfront office. But if somebody emails us, calls us, what have you, we'll go fill out the form as long as we have the license plate number and the location. Prior could be a day before. Prior could be three days before. But this is, this part of the, this part of the ordinance is not being changed and is not, in our view, problematic and is working pretty well. Well, that's a system that they have in place, and that's good to know. It really works with the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Conrad. Um, final speaker will be Mark Cooper. Um. Uh, Madam Chair and Commissioners and staff, I just wanted to... Uh, address the issue of liveaboards, uh, which we are one, and, uh, and I think as a suggestion, it might be some worthwhile considering in future to extend the blue permits to people who are one car per, to adults legitimately living aboard, who might have vehicles to them, and if there was an additional fee attached to that, it might make it easier to manage for that group of people to have a blue permit and then you wouldn't have to be calling. We would know we could go on vacation for a week or two weeks and not have to worry. So just a thought, you know, with respect to the blue permits and, uh, and paying the additional fee would not be a particular issue in my, my view whatsoever. Uh, I think it's more than reasonable as it stands. So there's a suggestion. Thank you for your comment. Uh, there being no further public comments, no additional ones, uh, is now to the commission for its comments. Uh, Commissioner Battlin. Thanks. Um, I did want to clarify um, just as far as where this process is at and kind of what we've commented on. The last meeting this was agendized. I specifically asked. There was some confusion. I asked staff where are we at in this process. And so I just want to run it down again so everybody's clear. What the commission did was tell staff, you know what, go back, enforce what's on the books, and then we're going to take a look at this. I think it was 60 or 90 days. I don't know where my mic went, but what we're hearing is that that enforcement has worked, and so there's nothing, nothing in the works for that permit. So I just want to make that clear. If I'm wrong, staff can correct me, but that's, that's where we're at. So there's no plans. It seems like everything's working with that. Unfortunately, we don't take questions outside of public comment. Um, and then the second thing, um, I actually did, did kind of have some concerns with uh, registers with as well. I hadn't thought about prior, but is what you're seeking to, to actually say the vehicle owner receives approval from the waterfront parking office. And I know this isn't uh, proposed language. This is what's on the books. But when we're cleaning it up, we might as well clean it all up. And I know there was the loophole of somebody moving to the stall next to them. And, you know, theoretically they could say, like the gentleman said, I sent you a note. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that we're not concerned with that. Madam Chair, Commissioner Bandelon, um, are, do you, if you have language that you're proposing, we're, we'd certainly be open to it as long as it captures the concept, which, which we at the staff level believe is part of the, um, the accommodation we're make, we want to make for folks who are going to be gone for longer than 72 hours. If you have language other than register, I understand register stands, sounds rather rigid and formal. Um, but if you had another suggestion, we'd certainly be open to it. Again, this language has been on the books for a couple decades, and we've honored it uh, in this fashion, and it, it seems to work. But if you have something you want to suggest, we're certainly open to it. Well, I, I was just more curious if, if what uh, – and again, I know you weren't seeking to change this, but were you more looking for approval from you and not just someone saying – The the recommendation before the commission tonight is to pr approve – these proposed changes to move to the Ordinance Committee of City Council for review. And, I'm not, and, and as part of that, I will be working with the City Attorney to make sure that we, have, we, haven't, we haven't misstepped legally, of course, and that the language is correct. And if there's anything substantive, this is typically the way, let me, let me offer a little bit of history here. We used to go, when we had, or when we had, Municipal code updates we do, mop up, you know, or updates or changes, what have you. We would go straight to the Ordinance Committee and to City Council. And many years ago, Ken Owen, many of you remember Ken, he, he served a lot of years on the Harbor Commission. He said, you know, it would be a great idea if you ran this by the Commission first, 
so we knew where you were headed with some of these ordinances. And we agreed. We thought, you know, that's really, you know, this, this is the framework for, for the, you know, this is the legal mechanism for the way we administer and manage the affairs of the waterfront. And so we thought it was a great idea. So ever since then, we've been doing that. So what we typically do is we bring it to the commission, get suggestions, comments, changes, and what have you that you might offer. And then I work with the city attorney's office. And then if there are substantive changes, we come back here, which ha luckily hasn't been the case in the past. We usually get most of the things ironed out at the staff level and at the staff commission level. And then once it goes to the, uh, once I work it out with the uh, uh, city attorney's office, they take this language and they draft it into ordinance form. And then that, that ordinance has to be passed by the city council proper. So um, for folks who are interested in this issue, there are a couple more bites of the apple uh, the, at the ordinance committee and at city council. But um, that's typically the way the process works. I hope that helps answer your question. Hey, and I appreciate that. I was just concerned that we were uh, kind of cleaning it up, uh, you know, the loophole, so to speak. But I, I see kind of another one there. And while we're at it, I thought we might look at that as well. So. Oh, we're I, I mean, if nobody else is concerned, then I'm, I'm not super concerned, but Commissioner Sloan. I'd throw it out there. Commissioner Sloan? Yeah, I think um, what you proposed was having approval, prior approval in there or something to that effect. Was, and I think, uh, I think approval means that if I send something to them, then they have to come back and say it's okay. I think the way it's written is we just register. I send an email or make a phone call or something like that, and I think we'd rather keep it along those lines rather than have to wait for something to come back to us to say that, that it is. But I understand that it can be a little bit vague, and as the gentleman pointed out, there really isn't a, a, a known procedure for how to do that. So I think by what uh, um, we've explained here tonight, that either email, phone call, or stopping by the office and filling out a form any time prior to leaving is acceptable, then I think that that should be sufficient. I mean, I, I mean does that work? or? <laughs> Yeah, I just kind of wanted to gauge the temperature of the commission on that. I was just kind of throwing that out there. I wasn't really saying too strongly one way or another. Commissioner Kelly? It's okay. Commissioner Sloan yeah. took care of it. Uh, any other comments from commissioners? Uh, then I think we should have a motion as to... I'll make okay. a motion to, okay. to approve it as written. I'll second that. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any ab uh, abstentions? Opposition? It's unanimous. Then. And the, on to the next item of the new business, um, which is uh, lease agreement, number, item number eight, office lease agreement with NOAA. Uh, Ms. Brzezinski, would you read the staff recommendation? Recommendation that Harbor Commission recommend City Council approve a five-year lease agreement with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration for office space located at 113 Harbor Way at a rent of $1,396.98 per month. Mr. Bossi. Good evening, Madam Chair. Um, coming shortly uh, in June of this year, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, will re be relocating the majority of their offices out to a brand new building at the University of California at Santa Barbara. However, they are, they currently have two vessels in the harbor, and that's the Shearwater and the Shark Cat, and they, those will be remaining in, in the harbor. And they would also like to maintain office space there to the tune of two offices and one storage area. Now, the Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary will be reducing their overall office footprint from the current 1,472 square feet, which is five offices and a storage area, to the two offices and a storage area that equals 452 square feet. The proposed term of the, of the agreement is five years, and as Ms. Przezinski said, the lease rate is $1,396.68 per month. So by simple math, you can figure out that three offices will be left vacant. Um, one of those office spaces um, will possibly be occupied via a first right of refusal in their lease agreement um, with Chuck's Waterfront Grill. Um, I believe they would like to staff their accounting an accountant there. Um, however, that still leaves two additional uh, spaces up, up for lease. And first, I want to say that, that if the Waterfront Grill moves forward with 
exercising that option, that will be before your commission for approval, as will if we go out to a request for proposal process for the remaining two offices. So that summarizes my, this item, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Uh, any questions, comments, Commissioner Sloan? Uh, yeah, you mentioned that uh, the two vessels in the harbor. That isn't related to this leasing in any way, is it? Madam Chair, Commissioner Sloan, no, it does not. Actually, those are separate items that one of them, the Shearwater, will be coming, is up for uh, renewal, and that will be coming back to your commission at the next appropriate date. It's ready. We're just waiting okay. to come back to you. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other questions, comment? Uh, Commissioner Webb. Um, which uh, uh, office would water, uh, the Waterfront Grill be interested in? Madam Chair, if you look at the attachment that was provided um, in your, with, with the staff report, the, the shaded or the scored, um, the hatch marked offices are where Noah would like to remain, two, two offices in a storage space. And there's one office, office number five, and then office number one on the other end, office number one and office number two. Those are the open offices, and Chuck's Waterfront is currently looking at office number five, but they do have the opportunity to look at the other two as well. But I, if I understand it correctly, they only have one person that they'd like to fit in there. So we're waiting on a response from them to see uh, what, their, what their option would like to be. If I may offer a point of clarification on that as well, Chuck's Waterfront Grill from their original lease has a right of first refusal of any space that comes available in the waterfront center building. So that's why they've sort of got first dibs on, on anything that comes open in that building. So, Any other questions, comments? And uh, If not, could I have a motion to um, approve, to recommend to the City Council approval of the uh, lease? So moved and Second. seconded. <laughs> uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, carries. Next item number nine of the special camping permit. Jeanette, would you please read the staff recommendation? Recommendation that Harbor Commission A, review and consider a request for the special permit to allow event participant camping in the Harbor West parking lot from 5 p.m. Friday, August 16th until 5 p.m. Sunday, August 18th during the 2013 Wine and, Wine and Roses Charity Regatta, and B, approve Wine and Roses event chairman Steve Leo's request for participant camping for the upcoming event as allowed per Santa Barbara Municipal Code section 15.16.090. Good evening, Madam Chair. It's me again. Um, <laughs> Welcome again. <laughs> the Wine and Roses Charity Regatta uh, is a California State Catamaran Championship that is held uh, each year uh, since, I should say, held at Ledbetter Beach each year since 1996, and it's always held in August. Um, it's sponsored by the Southern California Hobie Cat Fleets as well as the Santa Barbara Yacht Club, and they choose a particular um, nonprofit to support, and this year for the second year in a row, it's the, Make -A the local chapter of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Uh, the event organizers have always cooperated with local businesses as well as waterfront parking staff, and their use of the parking lot and the facilities when they leave is always nice and clean. Um, the boats and equipment on the beach, as you can imagine, are quite expenses, quite expensive and could potentially be the subject uh, or vulnerable to theft and vandalism. So one way to help with that and keep those safe are the opportunity to camp um, adjacent to their vessels. Now, normally camping in a public space uh, is prohibited by the municipal code. However, there is a portion of the municipal code that allows the Harbor Commission um, to have the discretion to post and designate an area for camping, but only within the waterfront's jurisdiction. So knowing that, and having done this in the past, um, a request has again come from the Wine and Roses Regatta for a camping permit so that participants may legally safeguard their equipment and the Harbor Commission has been receptive to this and approved this uh, camping permit since 1998. The request is for a 48-hour period beginning Friday, August 16th at 5 p.m. and going till Sunday, August 18th at 5 p.m. Uh, the, ex the event, similar to last year, is expected to use 130 spaces of our Harbor West parking lot. 
This is the hatched area um, that you'll see up on up on the board. So they're going to occupy 130 out of the roughly 199 spaces. They will pay for those spaces to the tune of $7 per space per day, which equals $910 per day. Um, that really is it. That's the extent of my presentation. I mean, I'd be happy to answer any questions that Thank you, you have, do Thank have. Thank you for the report. Any questions, any comments? Apparently not. Uh, Commissioner Sloan. Um, just two questions. One is, have there been any enforcement actions with these, or have they been basically good tenants in standing or whatever you want to call them? Uh, each time they visited, they've been uh, good neighbors. Good. And, if they weren't, we wouldn't be here recommending that they I stayed out so. on the beach front. No, but they've, been, they've worked very well with everybody. Harbor Patrol, as you can imagine, when they all come in, it's, it, it's quite an activity, but our parking staff handles it very well. The Wine and Roses Regatta knows the, knows the system, knows the process, and they know how to get in and out with as little confusion as possible. Okay. Second question is, uh, how does the uh, $910 per day compare to previous years? The same? If I remember correctly, Madam Chair, Commissioner Sno Sloan, it is the same as previous years since we've come to that rate. Um, however, um, with our proposed new parking rates, um, they would go into effect July 1st of this year. However, since they've already had this planned, um, we'd be granting them um, the seven dollar, the current rate. Right. Um, they have expressed some serious concern um, for future years um, with that rate instead of the seven dollar max. It would technically be going to $12, so we're going to have to work with them to figure something out. Okay. Thank you. Um, any other questions, comments? Commissioner Bathlin? It doesn't look like any, so I'll make a motion to approve it. It doesn't seem like it's been a year, though. Time flies. But I will make a motion for approval. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, motion carries. Point now is of Commission staff communications. Scott, do you have anything to share with us madam chair commissioners just two quick things um, the department presented its fiscal year 2014 2015 budget to the city council to mayor and council on Monday Commissioner Sloan was in attendance at the meeting um, it was just a work session they didn't take a vote or, or anything just they took a quick presentation and asked some questions and so forth so it's now in their hands um, and thankfully we are Pretty much done with the budget process um, and then Tuesday we went again to the Finance Committee Brian Bossy and I and um, went through in a little bit greater detail the fee increases that were um, that we've proposed that you all recommended approval and we did also raise the issue as Commissioner Sloan can confirm that the, the Harbor Commission's recommendation was approve the budget the waterfront departments budget staff recommended budget provided that the landscaping services be put out to competitive bid so that there was some discussion of that it was presented there's been some discussion of that and I'm sure there will be more to follow thank you uh, anything from the Commission I, and I believe Mick Cronman uh, had something to add as well madam chair thanks for indulging me I would be remiss if I didn't note that next week is national safe boating week which is um, particularly underscored by the fact that uh, California ranks only behind Florida in boating deaths annually. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so next Tuesday, there's going to be um, a joint exercise, a joint safety exercise out in front of Santa Barbara Harbor, including Harbor Patrol, uh, the Santa Barbara City Fire, uh, F uh, Fire Department's uh, water uh, rescue team, and weather permitting, a Coast Guard Hilo will be doing some, uh, some operations out there as well. So um, that's all going to be taking place Tuesday. But... Uh, there are some things to remember. It's always a good time to remember some tips for, uh, and it always comes up at clean, at safe boating week. Wear your life jackets. Mandatory for kids under 12 years old. Drinking and boating don't go together. 0.04 is the legal limit for for uh, commercial operators, and 0.08 is the legal limit for regular regular operators. Uh, file a float plan. Let somebody, the family or, or friends, know where you're going and when you're going. Those are sort of the, the major components, and watch your speed limits, and, and have a safe summer. So that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Eddie, one other uh, uh, comment going back, uh, having to do with the bidding out the landscaping and everything, because I did catch that when it popped up. I didn't hear it really, really clearly. But 
It was a little disconcerting because um, city administrator uh, kind of gave it the slant that there's only one commissioner that um, seems to have that as a concern and then that it was all voted on by the council. But being on the commission when that went through, it was 100 percent opposed by the uh, commission at the time. So uh, I would like at the staff's convenience, and it doesn't have, if we don't have a meeting in June, since it's not an issue that's going to come up soon, but to have it get on to an item agenda in the future so that when it's convenient, so that the commission can understand as a whole how it's happening and what the cost is that's coming into the commission since we are an enterprise zone and we're supposed to be matching our input with our output and and just so that everybody has a clear understanding of what the issue really is that's all that, that would be my concern mm -hmm. so that we can have a real uh, and then vote on it or something so that it can then go back in an again a unified way to the city council or it gets killed at the commission level uh, can I make one comment on that and just a clarification um, Jeanette, do you have the minutes from that meeting what what was the vote on the budget with that Amendment. I thought it was unanimous. You said it was opposed by everybody. No, no, I meant way back, back when when the landscaping issue. Oh, right, right. That right. was okay, but uniformly just, just opposed. Just a point of clarification. I think we was it unanimous that we we approved that. I thought so. Yes, it was. And yeah, okay. So I was speaking for the whole commission when I when I spoke to the council the other day, and I believe that uh, I thought we were all in agreement on that. Okay, thank you. Anyway. Is that, is that right? Yes. So it was unanimous? Yes, 7-0, correct. Okay, thank you very much. And I think that perhaps what Commissioner Kelly is also referring to is that uh, Council Member Rouse brought this up at City Council meeting uh, several days ago in terms of the uh, That's uh, Parks and Rec budget. And there was a discussion of approximately, um, I don't know, maybe you noticed, Frank, how, how, how long the discussion was, but it seemed to me about four or five minutes. Yeah, I happened to be, have, have it on. and. And it was at that point that uh, Mr. Armstrong mentioned one commissioner. And so th this was something that was brought up by Council Member Rouse at the in City Council. So I, w I would support uh, Commissioner Kelly's request on this. Um, any other? Com uh, commissioner Webb. Um, uh, Mick, what time does the uh, uh, safety uh, uh, activities start on Tuesday? Madam Chair, Commissioner Webb, I'm not exactly sure, but a press release will be coming out Monday with more specifics. It'll, it'll probably come from the fire department jointly with the Harbor Patrol. Commissioner Friedman. I'm going back to the last issue. I'm a little confused. I just want to clarify what we're bringing back, because my recollection was we had a report. It came to us. We all voted to accept it went forward and now I'm hearing we're going to bring it back again so we can all hear it again. I don't think so. I, think I just understand. What are, I, I, what are we bringing Kelly back and what are, we, what, what are we bringing back and let's, why? Let's and ask are we Commissioner Kelly. Already, I mean, what do you hey, have to what say? we would be bringing back is asking for a understanding of the whole landscaping issue. Um, a history would be good because you may not be aware of it. Um, and I won't go into a big part of it, but for five years or so, the city administrator would not allow us to even request an outside bid on landscaping. And it's not, it's not an issue of, of, of job protection it's an, or anything of that nature. I don't want it to go there. It's an issue of we're running an enterprise zone. So if we're being asked to run an enterprise zone, we should understand what that cost really would be and um, have an opportunity to understand that and potentially understand what it really costs 
the city to actually perform the function so that we because right now it's just kind of being what I heard in the parks and recs discussion is that this concern went like that off the table and so even though we have it as a concern it wasn't a concern so uh, on the part of the city administrator it was downplayed um, pretty much completely so I would like it to come back to the Commission so that we can have it as a real agenda item again because it wasn't heard and knock on the door and have it formulated so that we can represent it the next time there is a budget issue so I mean so this doesn't have to be soon but just so that it's clearly formulated again before that so that we have an opportunity to actually understand what the cost is what the savings might be because otherwise when it comes up right at the end at the budget it's too late again and it rolls through again. That's the point. Uh, Commissioner Bathlin. I had a much lighter topic I was going to talk about, but um, <laughs> I just wanted to, I, I, I think we need to let it play through the process because we, we forwarded our budget recommendations. They had their budget workshop, which is not just far from the budget vote. Commissioner Sloan was there. I've talked to one council member. I think it's, you know, it could be a fight at council, but that's their fight to have. We made the recommendation, and I think depending on what comes back, then, then I'd be willing to entertain bringing it back. But I, I don't really see what we're bringing back. It's, it's before the council. It's in the process. And I think we need to let it play through the process and then see what happens. Yeah, Just alone. I think I would, uh, I would agree with that, uh, Commissioner Kelly. I think that when, um, some of the things I heard at the, at the meeting the other day was that there's things that we might not understand about cost implications and things like that to having this done. First off is the staff time to put together an RFP is significant because there are a lot of things that go into that landscaping that we don't have an agreement with Parks and Rec. They just do it and things like that. If we put it out to bid, then there's a significant amount of, of, of staff time to put that RFP together. Um, the other thing is, is that, uh, I understand there's some employee issues and things like that, and that's for the council to worry about. So, so again, I think why don't we let it play out and see what they come back with. As you mentioned, we don't really have to talk about this again until another budget cycle. So we do have the luxury of that time at this point. So why don't we just, why don't we, we see how it plays out. Perhaps we can um, ask staff to keep us appraised of what that is because, you know, I, I unfortunately wasn't watching the meeting the other day, so I didn't know it even came up. So if you could keep us appraised of what the, the council discussions are and the recommendations, I think that would be great. And then maybe at that time we could ask for it to be come back. Would that be acceptable? Sure. My whole issue had a, a timing factor on it. I just wanted to bring it up now so that it would be there. I don't know which way it's going to play out. But the way it appeared to be being treated was inconsequential. I wouldn't say that from being Well, that was on the Parks and Rec's presentation. Okay. Because it was, if, if the city administrator presented it as if it was a concern to one commissioner, well, even would, though we passed it I would, unanimously. And, okay. and I did mention that. So, so he, he might have just meant, meant, meant that I was the only one at the meeting. So, so uh, can we... Okay. Uh, anyone, any other comments? Chair Otherwise, Crane, uh, can I get one more bite at the apple? I'll, I'll be really quick. I just wanted to quickly say it was great to see uh, the Amgen tour come to the waterfront. I don't think the city has a whole lot to do with uh, their route, but we had a finish yesterday, a start today, both on the waterfront. It was great to see all the uh, publicity, national television, beautiful day yesterday, a little bit overcast this morning, but uh, it was just great to see. So, thanks. Okay, on that note, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Aye.